There we go. Good morning. morning. I want to welcome everybody. So good to see you here today. And uh, we would like to have a record of everybody's attendance. If you would uh, sign the attendance pad and pass those, we appreciate it. want to welcome those of you joining us online. Delighted to have you as a part of our worship today. And we do ask you to hit the like button and the share button and to share the link uh, to our worship with with all of your friends and neighbors. Just a couple of words of announcement. First, uh, again from last week, let me uh, lift up that there is a barcode. Uh, you can find this little square. I, I guess it's not really a barcode. There's another name for it, but uh, a UR code. A QR code. Whatever this darn thing is, uh, you can find it on the little uh, little giving tray or the, the giving card tray on your pew. If you want to give online, just scan your phone and somehow that magically is going to take you to a link uh, to where you can make your, your uh, contribution online and that will be fine. We appreciate that so much. On that same note, this week you will receive a letter from me with an enclosed estimation of giving card uh, for next year. This is just for your reflection and your meditation. We do ask you to pray about it. There's a place uh, in the card to put an indication of what you hope or intend or are planning to give to the general fund, which is the fund out of which we do the daily administration, insurance and utility bills and salaries and, and all of that, apportionments. And, and you'll find that uh, in there. Then you'll find a place to make an estimate of your giving to the building loan. And we, I am praying and I'm thinking, by the time we get past the end of the year, we're going to be under $100,000 that we owe on this building loan. When I first came here, when I first came here in covered wagon and pony and everything, uh, <laughs> We, we owed over $800,000. It was, it was like $806,000, $60,000, something. So we have come a, a long way. I am hoping and praying that 2022 may be the year when we pay this off and burn that note. What a wonderful celebration. Uh, that would be way, way, way ahead of the scheduled payment plans. So. Anyway, if you'll fill these cards out, put them in an envelope, these are not going to be open, seal them. This is just for your information. Next week is daylight savings change, so be sure to fall back. But come and we'll have a, a time of sharing in Holy Communion. And we invite you to bring these cards just as kind of a, your covenant with God and place them on the altar here. We are not opening them. We haven't done this for two or three years now in the church office, so we have no idea what you're putting. We're just praying to have faith, to reach out in faith and do your best. It's, uh, I, I think someone said, I'd rather fail at a great goal than, than always achieve easy goals. So think about how, what God is calling you to reach out to do in your giving next year. We'll place these on the altar, and this right about this time in 2022, we will mail these back to you. And in your own privacy, again, you can open them and see what was, what was I like trying to accomplish in my stewardship last year. You can open it up and pray about uh, maybe God between that time and the end of the year can help you achieve that goal. Just, it'll just be a reminder what your goal was and how you were doing. So you will receive that this next next week. We again, remember the <clears throat> the time change coming up this week. Our United Methodist men are going to relaunch uh, their program, and uh, is that what Ken's going to open? Let Ken, why don't you just start all up, start it up, and others who have announcements kind of line up behind him here, and then one by one come right on up to share. Thanks. Actually, I have two quick announcements, but yes, the United Methodist men, we're going to try to start back up this Thursday at noon. It's going to be a lot easier for uh, some of the older folks and the older gentlemen that come to, to get here during the noon hour rather than the nighttime. So uh, I want to try to start serving lunch 
at noon. We're going to have beans and cornbread this week. And then i got chili planned for next month, so we'll uh, see how that goes. So all you fellows that can make it, we'd appreciate it. Is my name and number here. I'm going to put it out here on this table. If you want a reminder later in the week that we're going to do that, put your name and number down, and I'll be happy to call you on Wednesday to remind you. And uh, we'll see if we can't get kicked off again. The other thing is our pharmacy, that the one that the wife and I use, and probably some of you, is doing COVID vaccines. We've done vaccine clinics. We're doing booster clinics now. Uh, November 12th, here at the church, we're going to put on a COVID booster vaccination clinic. That's the uh, website on the screen there. Uh, it's free, of course. If you just go there starting tomorrow, I think it'll be open. And you can make an appointment for Friday the 12th and just fill it out and we'll get you in here and get you a booster if you want one. Is it both the, We're going to have both Pfizer both and, and the Moderna. And the Moderna. Okay. I do not know, he didn't answer me, if whether or not there's going to be just regular vaccinations as well. I see. But I'm sure if you come and there's the, if the vaccine, vaccine's available, they'll probably take care of you on it. But anyway, that's the word. I, I opened it yesterday, and it, you can, if you're on Pfizer, you can get in there today. But uh, I think if you go through it, you could probably sign it, going to ask you what you need and it, I think you can put it in there but they said did fix it and you would have both of them tomorrow so if you want to do that we'd certainly appreciate it we just want to throw it out there and try to help as many as we can Very thank good. you thank you <laughs> hello I'm inviting all women you don't have to be a United Methodist or a woman to be part of the United Methodist group. I always thought that was great. Um, but Thursday at six o'clock, we meet here for Joy Circle. We'd love to have you. And also um, the 13th Saturday at Tool Time in Tahlequah, uh, I'd like to have a couple of ladies going. I can't go, but I, there's a couple of people who would ride if you were, would drive. So. Let me know if you can go down for even half a day to Tahlequah. We have our items for the silent auction, and this supports the Indian clinics down there. Um, it's a wonderful drive, a, a beautiful place to be for half a day, and you help stuff stockings for the children or debone the turkeys, or there's things to do where you can sit down. You don't have to go out and rake leaves. The kids love to do that. They get on the truck and ride the leaves to the, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful time, so just let me know if you can go, because I have people who would like to go but cannot drive. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm here to talk about the pumpkin patch. We sold out. How about that? We sold out of pumpkins. I want to thank everybody that has helped with the pumpkin patch. It's long, it's tiring. The slots are only two hours, but we did it. And so everyone that helped, thank you very much because we couldn't have done it without you. I also want to let you know that in pumpkin sales, we, made, we sold 4,800 $95.50 for the pumpkins. For the donations we received was 972. Wow. That makes a total of $5,867.50. So, Very good. Thank you. Good morning. So um, I did want to let you know that we have collected 369 pairs of socks for Alan Bowden. 
I'm so excited. Um, I will have to admit Alex Prine had to help me with the math this morning because I'm still recovering from trunk or treat last night. So he had to help me add that up, but it was 369 pairs of socks total. So we're, and two, oh, three, help me out, Alex. 371. Three, <laughs> thank you, Kate. All right. So, um, and then we also, we also have another, um, we have another quick uh, aside announcement. Can I get all the staff to join me up on stage, those who can, please? Um, as Leslie put it, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. So we want to take a few moments just to honor Pastor Allen and Christy. Christy, could you come up and be with Pastor Allen, please? Now, this is scriptural. I found a scripture this morning in 1 Thessalonians. It's 5, 12 through 13. And it says, you may notice the thing that we've got going up here. It is, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. We adore this couple. They, are, they have set such an example, such a testimony of love and patience, the way they shepherd and guide, and we just... We, I, I couldn't be more thrilled to be on staff and be a part of this team. And I know that we all feel the same way. So um, in First Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13, so I don't get in trouble later, it says, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you, who hold them in their highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. So we've got a few people who are going to come up and say a couple things um, for Pastor Alan and Christy. Can, can you all be seen? Why are you hiding back there? Get over here. <laughs> <laughs> you were supposed to get them in front, Cape. Come on. Okay. So we want everybody to see. I said we're going to have um, Jay will come first, and then we'll hear from Terry, and then we'll finish with Cape. Gosh, Pastor Alan, thank you so much for all you do to be an example of of the kind of man I would like to be with your um, strength and conviction when it comes to good and evil and right and wrong there's no doubt but also with your understanding and compassion that allows you to see and talk to people in a way that causes them to want to change one of my personal experiences was when Trisha's mom was in the hospital uh, she calls me and says, your pastor came to visit me. I don't even know how you found out she was in the hospital. <laughs> but that is just one person. One, like, I know everyone has the same things. So thank you so much for all that you do and all that you are. Appreciate it. I'm not very good at just ad-libbing, so I wrote mine down. <laughs> um, when Christy and Alan and Beth came to our church, as most of you know, our church was in need of a shepherd, a serious shepherd. We didn't have one and we needed a shepherd. We were so fortunate because now we have three shepherds. Our life has been very, very touched by all of you. Our family has been blessed by the leadership and friendship of your family. The Snyder family always, always puts everyone else first, always. Christy shows up with cookies or something that she's made, rolls, right, rolls, <laughs> bread, I cannot tell you. And my dad, when my dad turned 97, they took time to go and be with them. And that meant so much, so much. And daddy still talks about his birthday and the presence of you all and everyone else in the church, how they surrounded him with love, even though he couldn't get out of the house. I just want to say thank you. You all mean the world to all of us. Well, thank you so much. And our church is much better off having three shepherds. Well, thank you so much. Well, as you guys can tell, you guys are very much appreciated. I want to thank you guys for your service and for your leadership in this church. Um, in my experience, uh, about a year and a half ago when I, when I came to this church, I was 
really in need of a home, and I was craving leadership and just uh, uh, somewhere where I could come and just uh, be myself and be uh, at peace. Um, and a year and a half ago, I found that at this church. Um, and it's because of you guys welcoming me and uh, making this a home for me. Um, so I want to thank you guys so much for that. You guys are very much appreciated for your hard work and for your leadership. Thank you, Kate. Um Now, we're going to pray over them real quick and bless okay. them. Uh, so if you were able to, I would like uh, for you to extend a hand just over them and just to bless them um, real quick as we pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for uh, just your awesome power, Lord, and for uh, your presence here at this church, Lord. Uh, God, I thank you so much for uh, the Schneiders and their presence, Lord. Uh, thank you for moving them to this church, Lord, and uh, blessing them. Uh, God, I just thank you um, that you are continually at, the, uh, at this work in this church. Uh, God, in their hearts, Lord, uh, God, continue to, uh, to bless them and um, uh, create in them just uh, amazing leaders that I know you can, Lord. Uh, God, I thank you for uh, their hearts uh, of service, Lord, of mission, God, of leading each and every person, Lord, of love, of peace, of joy, Lord. Uh, God, I thank you so much uh, for their kind spirits and their kind hearts, Lord. Uh, God, continue to bless them and their families and all the work that they do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you all so much. Yeah. Wow. And real, just love their attire. <laughs> and real quick, one, one quick announcement. Right after uh, service today, we're going to be uh, having a little reception in a part of the room just in celebration of uh, the Schneiders oh, wow. and, their, okay. and their work. So. Well, thank you. Well... That is very, very kind, and, and I will just say this is such an easy group to work with, and I say this sincerely because I've been doing this for 40, 45 years. This, and, and I hope the church recognizes this, this is a tremendous staff, uh, especially, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're not a large, large church. We're a, we're a medium-sized church, but we're surrounded in the greater Tulsa community by mega churches and huge churches. And I will just have to say that the quality of people, the dedication, the creativity, the hard work, uh, the, 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 the missional motivation of all of the members of the staff is just wonderful. And uh, last Monday night we had a charge conference uh, which members of our church council participated with. Our DS has been here. She came a couple, two or three weeks ago. It was the week we were doing uh, kind of our missions emphasis. And, uh, and that was fine. She said it gave her an opportunity just to get something, to know a little bit about the church and its outreach to the community. And she said that was very helpful. And then she came to our charge conference, uh, which went very, very well. And she told me afterwards, she said, this is one of the most congenial really missional-minded churches uh, in our district. This is just an amazing congregation here. And and she, believe me, she goes from church to church to church and hears and sees so much. But she was very, very impressed and very, very complimented this congregation. So thank you all uh, for those very kind uh, words today. But thank you to this congregation who has worked together so wonderfully uh, in the midst of difficult situations just to keep us moving forward for the kingdom of God and striving. And what, what is it we came up with 11 years ago? Living the love of Jesus. I think we're all of us, myself included, have been kind of on a journey of learning what that means. And if we just continue to be, as we say in our vision statement, a community of God's people striving to live the love of Jesus, um, God is going to continue to bless us. So I think, uh, Jim, it's time to take the offering and do the benediction now. we <laughs> So, oh, no, it's time for our call to worship. And, uh, Cabe, if you'll come up, let's enter into the spirit of worship of the congregation. We'll stand, please. The Lord is slow to anger, slow to anger. but great in power. The Lord will not have guilty and unpunished. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. But with the terrible blood, he will bring an end to unrighteousness.
join together in our prayer of confession and praise. Almighty God, pour, pour out, out your, your Holy Spirit, Spirit upon faith, faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in all temptations. Defend them against all their enemies. And bestow upon the church your saving peace. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May God's peace be with you. Would you extend a greeting of uh, peace and welcome one to the other? Almost One to be seated, and Jim and Terry will lead us in a song of praise number 701 when we all get to heaven. we do pray that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that as scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture this morning is from the first chapter of Nahum, and Kay will come and read that for us. This is Nahum chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. A prophecy concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Alkashite. The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and vents his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. The Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm, and clouds are the dust on his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Basham and Carmel wither, and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him, and the hills melt away. The earth trem trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like a fire. The rocks are shattered before him. The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, 
He will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the realm of darkness. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please feel free to sing with us. the breath, you breathe your life in me. You have been so, so
Amen. Thank you so much. And what a powerful, powerful word. And especially in light of our passage today from, from Nahum, we're continuing in our series on short and mighty, looking at some of the briefest books of the Old Testament, but books which are so powerful and speak in such powerful words. And we've looked at Zephaniah and Habakkuk and last week Jonah, and today is Nahum. And I'll just want to be honest with you. Uh, Nahum's not been a fun passage to prepare from. This has not been a fun prophet to read. He's not a real um, cheery kind of guy. (laughs) Uh, In fact, uh, this is a prophet so interesting. There's only three chapters to his writing. There's very little known about him. Uh, His name, it's recommended, means to comfort And when you read his prophecy, in the back of your mind, you're thinking, you've got to be kidding. He must have been uh, misnamed because he is indeed one of the most fiery prophets of the Old Testament. One of the ones that really causes us to think uh, about God, hopefully in a balanced kind of way. And we're going to look at what he has to say here today. This is such an interesting study. Because last week, you remember, we looked at the prophet Jonah. And do you remember who Jonah was commissioned to go preach to? Does anyone remember from last week? He was called to go and deliver a message to a city. Does anybody know what the city was? Nineveh. And to the Ninevites. And he was reluctant to do that. But Jonah finally relented uh, after great uh, encouragement. And went to Nineveh and preached. And do you remember what happened when Jonah preached to the Ninevites? Uh, They repented. And there was a revival, a deep revival in that whole community. And God's mercy was displayed and shown. And even the king, the rulers of the city, uh, said, we need to repent and turn ourselves to God. And there was a great revival in that whole city. One of the greatest revivals recorded in the Old Testament, kind of upset Jonah that God was so merciful and gracious to these people, the Ninevites, but it it saved and, and brought renewal to their whole city. Well, Nahum now is writing almost exactly 100 years later. 100 years later. And while Jonah was from the northern kingdom, the northern kingdom is now been disposed, captured by Assyria. Nahum is writing from the southern kingdom, but he's writing to this same community, to Nineveh. The only problem is that 100 years later, after this tremendous revival and response to Jonah's preaching, the city of Nineveh has completely fallen apart in terms of their faith in God, in terms of their moral values, in terms of their understanding of justice, that great city which one time experienced such a great revival turned itself away from God in such a dramatic way. And now 100 years later, Nahum prophesies against Nineveh and basically says, you can't be like that. You can't Enjoy the blessing of God and the forgiveness of God and and bask in his mercy and forgiveness and then just take it in a kind of a trifle way and go ahead and turn your face on God. You can't do that for there's one basic message that, that the prophet Nahum says and that, that is while God is rich in mercy, his justice is always is also sure. It's like, it's like God is, is two sides. The character of God is like two sides of a coin. On the one side is this wonderful mercy and love and forgiveness that he wants to 
bestow upon people, but on the other side, God is a God of justice and and a God who who punishes the unrighteous and a God that does not tolerate or look upon evil. And these two go hand in hand. And yet sometimes uh, I think we want a two-headed coin <laughs> when it comes to God. We want God just to be merciful and just and merciful and compassion no matter what we do, no matter what our response is, no matter the way... But 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 Nahum says, while God is rich in mercy, we need to be clear that his justice and what he expects of us is also a part of his nature and character. And so there's really just two basic messages and then one clear principle that come out of this very short but powerful book, out of this very short book with powerful, powerful words. And the first is just simply what the praise team sang about God is rich. In mercy, and in fact, when you go to Nahum chapter 1 and you go to verses 7 and 8, this is the most uplifting, encouraging words. It says, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. The people of Nineveh knew that. They called upon him a hundred years ago and found him to be a refuge in time of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. So think of these three statements. The Lord is good. And think about that. We're coming up on a time of Thanksgiving season and how we need to be mindful that the Lord has blessed us in so many ways. Yes, there have been hardships and difficulties and setbacks, and some have had such challenges. We don't take that, we don't say that lightly. Some have had, you know, times in their life when they've wondered, am I going to get through this? But if you look at your life and you look at your, 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 the journey you've been on, you see that the Lord is indeed good. In fact, there's a little, I don't know what you call mantra that they do in some congregations. I've never done it here, but I've seen congregations do it to where there's a kind of a response between a leader who says God is good and the people say all the time and the leader says all the time and the people say God is good. I bet we can do it. God is good all the time. Okay, so some churches do that almost like their affirmation of faith. Not as fancy as the Apostles' Creed, but it gets the idea God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. And so to live in that spirit that God is blessing us day after day after day, that day after day God is good to us. And then when those difficult times do come in our life, because we do have rough edges when illness comes or calamity comes or financial upsets come, uh, a friend of mine, single mother with a couple of kids, texted me last week and said, uh, this is a tough time. I just, uh, my company's laying people off and I got laid. And here's this young mother with a uh, single mother with a couple of kids. She said, I've got to go out job hunting and still take care of the kids. And I said, I'm adding you to my prayer lift. Calamities come. But the second part of this affirmation is God is a refuge in times of trouble. If only we will remember it, if only we will yield ourselves to that and, and live in that, to know it is to God, God to whom we should turn in times of trouble. Yesterday, uh, we had a marvelous, marvelous trunk or treat event. Sherry and Cabe and others uh, participated. Just a, a wonderful time. I think we had over, um, I think Sherry's gone, I think she said over 200 cars. And there's probably three to four people in each car. So we had six to eight hundred people come through. And as they drove through and they came around and made their turn, we had it set up to where they'd make their turn in through the circle drive over here and, and drive by the pumpkin patch. And there was a team of us there to offer prayer to people who didn't force it on anybody. But we said, we've got New Testaments. We've got children's literature. If you've got a special need, we'll share a prayer. April was over there. Pat Graham. Uh, Leslie came, and at times we had cars kind of lined up when each of us had different windows of the car saying, can we have a prayer for you? Sometimes we were kind of bunched up. And April and I were talking about it this morning, and I'm guessing close to 70%. I didn't take any exact numbers. Close to 70% when we said, can we be praying for you in some way? They would sometimes would say, yes, just pray that God would bless us. But sometimes, you know, it was, uh, uh, I remember one lady came through and said, I'm a widow. I lost my husband several months ago. And, and I was, 
invited to have a prayer with her. There was a little child that said, I forget if she said his papa or his grandpa or his something like that was sick with cancer. And we prayed for that family. And I'm going to guess probably 70% of the people willingly, you know, said, yes, I would like for someone in the church to pray for me. So this was not just a tremendous day of fun and Candy and children dressed up. This was a day of ministry and prayer and lifting people up. Because I think when given the invitation or the reminder, people know it is God who is our refuge in times of trouble. And Nahum uh, affirms that. God is one to whom we can turn in times of trouble. Then he says he cares for those who trust in him. And, And all we have to do is just put our trust in him And we will experience his ongoing care and compassion. And you know where I see that and and where a lot of people first realize that, and April's going to know this through her work in criminal justice, and those of you who have been in Emmaus are going to know this. Sometimes in these support groups where people go through an Emmaus walk or they have uh, somehow the course of their life has led them through our criminal justice ministries, and now they're in... um, Redemption Church or one of the groups that are sponsored by them. And sometimes people first learn the depth of the care that God has for them through communities of care of which they become a part. These are a small group of people who love them, uh, sometimes in spite of who they are, love them in, in light of the challenges that they face, love them just because they're going through the next stage. But these Emmaus reunion groups are... There's all kinds of groups of of times that people get involved in, and it's there that they experience the care of God in such wonderful ways because he does care, and a lot of times it's through groups like that for those who trust in him. But then, now the coin flips. (laughs) Those two verses in this whole three chapters talk about the wonderful grace and mercy of God. But we won't read the entire rest of the book, but uh, chapter 1, verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger, but great in power. He will not leave the guilty unpunished. It's, it's, it's a verse that's repeated at different times that there comes a point in time we need to be careful about being presumptuous with the grace of God. We, we, we make a big mistake if we just think that we can receive the blessing of God and, and in a kind of a, a semi kind of way say, thank you God for getting me out of that mess and then go about and just live any way we want to and turn our back on God and just uh, live like, you know, God's there for me when I really need to be bailed out. But other than that, I can just do my own thing and it doesn't matter how I treat other people. It doesn't matter how I conduct my life. Doesn't matter whether I really pay attention or turn to God or give my heart uh, to Him in any in any specific way, um, but 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 God says, you know, the Lord is slow to anger. He's longing for people to come to repentance, but He's great in power, and in the end, He will not leave the guilty unpunished. We go on. To verses 8 and 9. It says, The Lord is good, a refuge to those in trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into the darkness. He's saying, Nineveh, what's gone on? I sent the prophet Jonah a hundred years ago to turn you on a different path. And you responded, but now everything has fallen apart. And I won't go through every indictment that, that Nahum speaks against the people here, but you know some of the, the saddest <laughs> and most powerful words that I have found anywhere in the Scripture is Nahum chapter 2, verse 13. Listen to these words and let them sink in. They're, they repeat themselves. Nahum 2, verse 13, I am against you, declares the Lord Almighty. I will burn up your chariots in smoke and and your sword will devour your young lions. Uh, The voices of your messengers will no longer be heard. 
to come to a point in the journey where God says to a people, I'm against you. Now, that is serious words and serious business. And then, go on down to chapter 3, verse 5. He repeats that same sentence. I'm against you, declares the Lord Almighty. Goes on and talks about uh, the, the kind of judgment or, or punishment that's going to come upon them. So these are people who, who not only turned their back on God, they turned their back on God uh, with a spirit of arrogance. They turned their back on God uh, in, in, a, in a manner of forsaking him. And they did it over a period of 100 years. And, and it's interesting. I remember years ago talking to uh, one of the judges, longtime judges in the community where I served. And we were, we were talking about the criminal justice system and people that find themselves in that. And he was saying, you know, Alan, what a lot of people don't realize, because this part doesn't get lifted up too much, he says, the criminal justice system works very effectively in turning the lives of many people around. He says there are many people that have some scrape with the law and end up in the criminal justice center and they have one trip to court and they receive probation or a second chance or some kind of program of rehabilitation. And he said this doesn't get reported very often, but there are people whose lives are reshaped and and stopped and turned around. And, and uh, Christy and I have some very, very, very dear friends whose daughter went through that, got herself in serious trouble actually spent some time in a in a in a incarcerated but through that found the grace of God and her life has turned around and she got out and went through and completed her college and got married and has children and is doing well today. So the criminal justice system does a wonderful job in, in far more than we sometimes realize in helping people stop and, and think about where their life is headed and getting turned around. But then this judge told me, he said, Alan, there's another group of people that no matter how many chances we give them, no matter how many opportunities for rehabilitation, no matter how many programs uh, of renewal or or healing we, we put them through or opportunities we give them through, he said, it just seems like they're working hard to work their way into Big Mac. And he used that term. He said, sometimes people that, that end up in incarcerated for long periods of time and are more serious places of incarceration, he said, sometimes they've almost had to break in there through the persistence of their behavior and their lifestyle and their choices. And he said, it's really sad. There comes to a point where we no longer know how to help these people or how to turn their lives around or how to get them on the right track or or how to give them a second chance, there comes a point where the decisions and the course of their life end them up in a place of confinement and containment for their own safety and the safety of others as well. And so I think when you look at this book of Nahum, and it's not an easy, if you're, if you're wanting to have a quiet evening and a, and a, on a cool night and a cup of hot chocolate and just do some devotional reading, Nahum's not the book to ponder. It's, 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 not, it's not the book to just think about if you're wanting, because it'll, if you're wanting, if you're wanting to seriously reflect on where my life's going and what might be the outcome, then maybe take a look at that. But, but there's one major principle that comes out of this book, and it's just simply this. As we have received God's mercy, let us walk in that. When God forgives us and redeems us and restores us and, and, and renews our life and graciously, graciously redeems us and sets us on a new path, walk on that path of newness. Walk on that path of grace. Walk with God in that newness of life. In Colossians, Paul says, just as you have received Christ as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. That's the goal. That's what God wants. As we have received Christ as Lord, now make, make that Lordship of Christ a part of our daily walk. Walk with Him, not, not in the bad times and forget Him in the good, but walk with Him day by day and give thanks to God because all the times God is good and, and God is good all the time. Rejoice in that and walk in that sense 
walk in that sense of renewal and and uh, forgiveness and grace that God has given to us. It's a tremendous lesson. There are warnings to nations, and and part of this book of Nahum is is a message to a major city. And it's a it's a message to to nations that nations better not turn their back on God. We are. We as a nation have been so blessed. Does America have faults? You bet it does. Has it made mistakes? You bet it has. But we as a nation have been so, so blessed. And as we approach the season of Thanksgiving, I hope we will live in that deep sense of how blessed we are to live in this great land and to continue to pray for our nation because... One of the messages of Nahum is that nations shouldn't turn their back on God. When nations turn their back on God, things do not go well. And we've seen it all throughout the course of history. Nations rise and nations fall, nations rise and nations fall, nations rise and nations fall. And usually the reason they fall is because of their own self-doing. It's, it's, it's because of their own self-destruction, their own practices, the way they they treat and and, and neglect God and treat others. But this is a a message, which is a message to individuals as well. It's echoed in the New Testament in many passages. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to hold the unrighteousness for punishment on a day of judgment. God wants to rescue us from trials. That's That's the message of the prophets of the Bible. God is wanting to rescue us out of our trials, out of the pit of our despair, out of the the depths of our own iniquity, out out of the consequences of our own bad judgment. No matter how far down that path we've been, God's purpose is to rescue. He is slow to anger and wants to rescue us. But we should not be trifling with the judgment of God because the other side of that coin is the Lord knows how to hold the unrighteous for a day of punishment. So there's the message of Nahum, short but powerful, uh, hopeful but to the point. God is rich in mercy, but Nahum says, forget not for his justice also is very sure. Thanks be to God. Amen. I know a number have been spending time so these last uh, couple of weeks, and we did it for two weeks, and we expanded it for two more weeks, and I've not provided as much opportunity as I'd intended to, but this morning I want to provide just a little bit of opportunity. If anyone would like to share just a word, where in the last couple of weeks, where in the last month have you seen God at work in this church? Has anybody seen God showing up? In the life of this church or in the lives of their families in the last so Pat's got his hand up. You want to come up here, Pat, or you want to speak from there? He's gonna come on up and you can either speak from where you are or if you want to come up, you're welcome to. Yeah, this isn't rehearsed or anything and it's just uh, kind of off the cuff but uh, I've been struck lately about the humongous heart that our congregation has for missions for outside the walls of this church 
I was amazed yesterday, as the pastor said, uh, with the number of people asking for prayer and very receptive to it. Um, coming through the, the trunk or treat line, uh, it was, uh, some of them were really heart wrenching. And uh, others were almost joyful that they got prayer. Uh, I know prayer works. I know that uh, God listens. And there are people out there that uh, are hurting and, and searching. And uh, I think our church is pretty good at reaching out and ministering. One thing I think we need to do a little bit better at is our evangelism, uh, the evangelism side of it. And um, there were a number of people that we talked to uh, that did not have a church home. And we invited them to attend here and to uh, come join with us. Uh, I always told them, this is the friendliest church you're probably ever going to find. And it is. I've, I've been convinced of that. I've got to see some heads nodding. Uh, I mean, uh, we just need to be open when we see people to hear what their needs are, to minister to them, to pray for them, to pray with them. Help them to know that God loves them, that his grace and mercy is all they really need. And I think, I think if we can do that, we can revitalize our church here because the spirit is willing here. Our bodies are all getting older and it's much harder to do. So we need some, some more bodies to help. And it's been on my heart a lot lately, and I wanted to see the uh, see what uh, uh, Trunk or Treat brought to us. Um, our program up on the hill has been amazing. Just had a young man here just this morning uh, that we met up there, and um, he needs a little help. But uh, he's a good kid, and I, I really, really like him. And, and I would love to see him join with us at some point. But uh, I just want to encourage people. I just want to encourage you. It, you don't have to be perfect. When you're talking to people, God will give you the words. The Holy Spirit will take over. And... And uh, just be open. Have your heart open. Listen and respond. And if you do that, you might make uh, a difference in someone's life. It might be the seed. It might, you know, we talk about that all the time, about the seeds that, that we sow. We don't know which ones will spring up or when. You know, we plant the seed. Someone else may water it but God makes it grow. And that might be the seed that starts something. And there is a lot of people hurting. There's a lot of people that need it. Uh, so I just want to encourage everyone. I think we're doing good. We just need to do a little bit more. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. And these... These next two months are going to be windows of opportunity because um, there's a lot of people that are scared and hurting and have needs. So this is going to be a window of opportunity to be sharing. Anybody else want to say just a brief word how you've seen God at work? Uh, and you don't have to come up. You can just say it from. So uh, thank you for the flowers, beautiful flowers and the given by the primes and the grams. That's so appreciated. And again, thank you to all of you because you make ministry so enjoyable. Uh, special concerns. I did talk to Lynn Rochester. Bill is at a uh, kind of a rehab center. 
from the hospital to the rehab center, but hopefully coming home Thursday, he will continue in some rehabilitation at home. So let's continue to lift their family up. They've had a long go. Yes. So Margaret and, and uh, dealing with a cancer, a tumor on the throat, and radiation and chemo treatments. And uh, Terry, where did Terry get off? Jake's settling in a little bit, and Jake and Dortha. So starting Tuesday, then they can have contact and visitors and such. So we pray, pray that they'll come to a point where they can be out and with friends and such. Someone's pointing. I don't know where they're pointing to. There we go. I'm sorry. I, I saw Robert pointing and I couldn't figure out. He's not a good, good pointer dog, but uh, he. Okay. I'm sorry. Christy, go right ahead. Oh my. Um, they're going to try to repair it on the 9th. If they can't, he'll have to have a gastric bypass. And so please pray for him. He feels like he's starving, but anytime he's, he just can't eat anything. Right. Lots of challenges. Let's, let's turn to the Lord. Lord, for these special needs and some undergoing surgery and some facing various kinds of radiation and chemo treatments and others just with family challenges and and life challenges. So many needs upon us, but we just thank you that you are always the one to whom we can turn to in times of trouble, that you are there, that you care, that you're good to us all the time, and let us just live in that spirit of grace and care. Thank you for all of the effort that went into making our pumpkin patch a wonderful time of outreach to this community and fundraising for our missions programs, for the, for the trunk or treat and everybody that brought candy and set up uh, trunks and came and worked and, and handed out literature and prayed and just was involved in providing a wonderful time of gathering, safe gathering for our community. We know, dear God, that in the upcoming Uh, weeks and months. There are going to be other opportunities, and we just pray that you would give us the the right attitude that we're doing this for you and to serve this community. Help us to live your love in every way that we can, that your light might shine. And we ask this all in Christ's name, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. As our ushers come, let us continue in the spirit of prayer. And Lord, bless our giving and all that we Uh, respond to the blessings that you have given to us. Help us to be good stewards of what you've entrusted to us through Christ our Lord. Amen.
Uh, this is technically All Saints Sunday. Now, in terms of recognizing those uh, by name who have gone on to be with the Lord, we do that on Memorial Weekend. But still, uh, this is a Sunday when we think about the saints of God who have been a part of this church and, and have gone on to be with the Lord now. So we sing this song in honor to them as we do. If you feel led to profess your faith or want to come for a moment of prayer, you are welcome. It's number 712. I sing a song of the saints of God. I love that song. They were saints of God, whether rich or poor, and I mean to be one too. May that be the prayer and, and goal of us all. Go forth in peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.